This is All Things Considered on GPB. I'm Peter Biello. The last few years for Atlanta-based comedian Heather McMahon have been chock full of achievements aspiring comedians dream of. She's recorded two Netflix specials and participated in the Netflix is a Joke comedy festival, conducted interviews on the Oscars red carpet on E-Television. She's grown her podcast following, and she's connecting with audiences on topics both serious and silly, including the death of her father and her IVF journey. Heather McMahon is with me now to talk about her amazing career. Heather, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This is very cool. Very cool to have you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your origins as a comedian because uh-huh. in, your, in your first special, uh, Son I Never Had, you talked to some extent about uh, Instagram being the thing that really helped you take off. But I imagine that is just the tip of the iceberg. The seven eighths are still underneath as you're working on your material, perhaps yeah. on stage in smaller clubs. Is that what it was like for you? Yeah. I mean, I um, got my start in New York and then moved to L.A. Uh, I, I kind of worked my way through this this club called the Upright Citizens Brigade. So I was always on the like improv sketch comedy trajectory. And then um, I kind of got back to my roots and just started doing stand up. And I realized that I just loved it so much because it, 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 you know, I could say whatever I want. Um, So stand up is what really launched me, but I used Instagram as a tool to get all my material out there, much like all these, you know, up uh, these big comedians now coming up through TikTok. It's just another vessel to get your material out there. And was it useful as like immediate feedback? Like you're learning what catches on and you're learning what doesn't, and then you can use that on the stage. Oh, absolutely. And the way I really took off when Instagram stories became a thing, and now it's like, you know, the, the grandma thing to do, but, um, and I would literally like write bits in like 15 second intervals. Uh, so that's kind of how I really started to like hone my um, uh, my timing and, and my material, and it was immediate. Like I, my... I guess I guess you could say people would slide in the DMs, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, and it was immediate. Just the engagement was through the roof, and it was insane. So then, um, my agents were like, "Let's put a you know a tour on sale and see how it goes," and it sold out in like the first ten minutes, and it was just insane. And it's grown from there. So I owe a lot to to the early days of Instagram. You are very vulnerable about yourself in your podcast, yeah, and on stage, uh, in your in your videos on social media. Were you instantly vulnerable like that or did you take some time for you to sort of open up and be comfortable with putting yourself completely out there? My comedy has always been, um, obviously, from my point of view, my perspective, right? I can't tell somebody else's story. And at the time that things really took off, I was actually at a very dark, deep, depressed time of my life. I just lost my father uh, to cancer and it happened very quickly. So my life kind of uh, was completely shaken up. So I started... I was always doing funny things on Instagram even before he died, but then I started to put these very vulnerable moments on Instagram. And it wasn't to uh, appeal to anybody but myself. It was just very cathartic for me, and it was unhinged. I'd have like seven glasses of Chardonnay, and then I'm like, (laughs) let's try out this new bit on Instagram, and it worked. And the response that I got specifically from other women that were like, thank you so much for talking about this. Thank you for so much for taking us on your journey. I realized I wasn't the only one who was going through that. And it just made me double down on what I was talking about. And it just really took off from there. Wow. OK, well, we're going to talk a little bit about your dad, yeah. your audience and how you connect with uh, your audience in general. But first, I don't want to get too far before we give uh, our audience a sense of what your comedy is like. Uh, so we have a brief clip from your first Here we comedy go. special, uh, Son I Never Had. Let's watch it. <laughs> And listen, I was watching my uh, therapist the other day on TikTok, and... (laughs) Oh, yeah, my therapist is TikTok, so... (laughs) And she was saying, she was like, Heather, would you talk to your eight-year-old self the way you have been talking to your adult self? So that's from Son I Never Had, and there's a version of this conversation happening now on video. You can watch it at gpb.org. But for our radio audience, what you can't see in the video is that Heather is dancing the way ridiculous TikTok people dance uh, while she's saying all that. So I wanted to ask you about the physical aspect of your comedy. Yeah. Um, Because you are not just dancing. Sometimes you're lunging. Sometimes you're running. You're kicking. Um, How important is it to you to be that kind of a presence on stage? It's just what I know. It's in my nature. Like, I... I commend other artists who just can stand there and deliver jokes, but 
so much of my comedy is through my physical, uh, you know, charisma, if you will. I just don't know how to stand still. I've always worked a stage. I've I, I've always been in a glitter suit or feathers or something bedazzled. I just like to be a very uh, an old school showman. That is my performance style. So people like when they come to my show, they're like, you you know, if I wear an Apple Watch, I walk like 15 miles <laughs> <laughs> on stage, and I that's the best workout I could ever do is just doing 90 minutes of comedy every night. So when you're doing a podcast and you're having to sit still, is it just driving you mad? Yeah, and I'm sweating through my t-shirt for no reason just because I'm anxious. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to ask you about your father and uh-huh. his influence on you because your son I never had, referring to the thing he says about you, right? You're the son he never had. Right. In the intro to that show on Netflix, you uh, are shown bringing out an urn, supposedly your dad, mm-hmm. uh, although I think he was scattered at a Waffle House, right? Yes, he was scattered at a Waffle House <laughs> and all over the state of Georgia, but yes. Okay, so so important places to him. Right. Georgia, in general, Waffle House in particular. But he's he's brought out, and then you talk about his, his passing on your special, and you make something very heavy, very serious and sad, funny. And I'm curious about how you worked on that, how you made that happen. Well, honestly, the whole situation in real life was actually quite funny. And I do think that that's the universe's way of just like, you know, the pendulum swings super dark. But then there were moments of levity that were so ridiculous and absurd and unhinged. I'm like, God's pulling a prank on me. Like, like I'm how getting sexy popped. the doctor was. Oh, and... yeah. The doctor who told us our, da- our father wasn't going to make it was the hottest man I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, I, you know, it just everything. You know, my dad ended up being too fat for the casket that we had originally bought for him so we had to get a plus size casket and my mom's like over my dead body and his am I gonna uh, let my husband feel like he was a heavy set even going down into the ground so we cremated him uh, because he was too chubby I mean there were just so many moments where I'm like this is not actually happening so I obviously as a professional orator if you will I said I have to explain this to my audience so that they understand that even if they're about to go through something really dark you have to find those ridiculous moments moments because everything is so absurd right there is life before my dad or life with my dad and then life after my dad and I think once you go through something traumatic like losing a loved one you, it completely changes you as a person now I feel like mm, I'm not afraid of death I'm not afraid of what's next because I've already I've already felt that horrible pain that nobody like my life is forever changed so I don't know why I just have a very like joyful perspective on a lot of stuff now um, because I've been there I've been at the bottom but now when I'm when I'm at the top it feels even sweeter mm-hmm. I don't know if that made much sense, but it's just such a an emotional pendulum of um, of now I get life. So I have to giggle about life. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll disclose that I am also a member of the Dead Dad Club, which is how you put it in your special. Like, who's a member of the Dead Dad Club? Right. Like, I am. Uh, and uh, it, it does, I, I see what you mean, right? It changes the way you think about things. Uh, it, it When one parent dies, it changes the way you feel about the, the remaining parent. And you still right. have your mom, yes. Robin, who is, I don't know if it was always this way or intended to be this way, but she's a part of your act in some ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the next tour um, that I'll take out, I'm sure, is about me living with my mom. I mean, it's it's not normal. I, I was always very close to both my parents. My parents were madly in love. So I had this kind of like, we called it the nuclear family. It was like my mom, my sister, my dad, and I. And then when my dad died, it I, I basically had to like pick up my entire life in LA, move back to Atlanta, and help us all figure out the the new normal. So, um, and currently, my husband and I we left our apartment in New York and moved back into our, my childhood home in Atlanta mm-hmm. with my mom. So it's not normal to be married and living with your mom, but here we are. It's like three's company. It's insane. Yeah, and she goes to your shows. I, I went to your show in Charleston, and she was like in the balcony, and you were conversing uh, with her during the show. Yeah. And... Oh, she likes to wave from her balcony seats, and you know, like she is the queen of England. She absolutely loves it. It. Um, I've created an absolute monster. It's insane. Like, well, you know, people will recognize her in Atlanta and come up and take photos, and then she'll just give everyone my personal number. She's like, Heather, <laughs> I met some great girl named Karen today. She's going through a hard time. She's going to call you. And I'm like, Mom, you cannot give out my personal number to everyone. <laughs> to, to explain the, the accent to, to folks who aren't familiar with your comedy. Uh-huh. So your mom is from Massachusetts? Yeah. And your dad was from Georgia? Yeah, my mom's packing the car in Harvard Yard. Okay. Um, but she's lived in Georgia for 35 years, but thinks that she has a southern accent. So she'll go to our country club, and she's like, 
like, man, it's rather warm in here. And everyone's like, Robin, just stay Bostonian. <laughs> Lean into who you are. But she she loves to say that she's super Southern. She is not. Um, but yeah, my dad was born and raised in Georgia. And I, it's funny, every time I leave Georgia, like, you know, I, I went away for school. I came back for a second. I moved to New York. I came back for a second. I went to LA. I came back for a second. And then my husband and I were living in New York and then the pandemic hit and we moved back. Like every four years, I try and get away from Georgia and it pulls me back. And now I am just leaning in and I love Atlanta so much and I'm so proud to be from here. I love it. So did you grow up ITP or OTP? Well, um, DeKalb County. So technically, um, uh, technically ITP, uh, but then we moved OTP pretty like in, you know, middle school. Okay. Yeah. How how did you think your your Georgia upbringing sort of shaped uh, your your comedy or or your approach to, to your work? I think Southerners get away with saying so much. You know, <laughs> Northerners are a little bit more br- brash in your face. They say it like it is. But Southerners say it with a little bit care of, of honey dripping out of their mouth. And mm-hmm. that's what I love. They can get away with saying so much and really packing a punch without being blatantly like... <laughs> You know, like, can you give an example of something you feel like you've um, gotten away with saying because you've added the southern sweetness? I, I mean, gosh, well, you know, they always say in the south, like, oh, we don't gossip, we have prayer requests, and, <laughs> and that's something that I'm obsessed with. Like, it's moving back into my childhood home. We have this intense HOA, and there was a guy in our neighborhood who's going through this nasty divorce with his wife, and so he sent an email to our entire HOA. Hey, y'all, I need you to pray for my wife, Tammy. Tammy just got a mommy makeover, and she's not healing well from her breast augmentation. So I just want y'all to keep her in her prayers and i'm like this is so shady and i'm obsessed with it just southerners have a way of just airing your dirty laundry and being so ridiculously funny without actually um acting like it's coming from a place of them just trying to be blatant about what they're saying and i'm obsessed (laughs) with that i'm like this guy is just throwing his ex-wife under the bus right now of her getting her (laughs) boobs done and i am absolutely obsessed you know it's it's funny watching your comedy i never would have Said, oh yeah, she's she's a southern comedian, but I uh-huh. haven't. I've heard you describe on your podcast. You came just short of saying you're the Paula Dean. Yeah. Of, of of comedians, but not for obvious reasons, Paula Dean. No, we were trying to figure, I used to do an, uh, an Ina Garden, a Barefoot Contessa impression, and I'm obsessed with her. I was like, uh, Paula Dean's problematic, so let's not lean into Paula Dean. But I, you know, it's funny, I don't really have a super Southern accent. I can put it on when I need to, but I went to school at the University of Mississippi. I consider myself a very proud Southerner, um, but, you know, I, I have a Bostonian mom, so people always think I'm from Chicago. I give Midwest vibes, apparently. Okay. Yeah, but I I ran my sorority, so I'm a a true (laughs) Southern belle. Don't you test me. Okay. Um, Wanted to ask you about IVF because you talked about it on your on your special. Uh, You you talk about the the indignities of IVF, but also the success you had. You have a a, a baby girl embryo. Yes. Um, So congratulations. Thank you. That's a big deal. We got one. We We, got one in a freezer somewhere. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, (laughs) And I know you don't get political in your in your comedy, but I had to ask because. IVF has since become a political football. Right. So I'm wondering, you hear all this stuff out of Alabama, you know, an embryo finally achieving the rights of a child, according to the Supreme Court of Alabama. What went through your mind when you heard all that? It was really jarring because I had to do IVF multiple times. So I really feel for the women who are trying to be moms. I did not have a typical IVF journey where you go in and, you know, you do one round of shots, you get a bunch of eggs. That just was not my journey. So I I, I don't know. I feel both ways. I know how hard it is because I'm going to have to do this again, um, how hard it is to, um, you know, try and go through that process. But also it's like, the protection needs to be on the parents, the woman. Like, there's so much that we go through. And the fact that you could, the whole thing just made me absolutely angry. Just to get to the point, it made me absolutely angry. And I have other girlfriends, and I try to be very encouraging and promote IVF. And I've had a lot of people come to me and be like, Heather, I'm nervous about doing it in Georgia. I'm nervous about doing it in other southern states. And I'm like, I get it. I don't blame you for being nervous. You know, when all that went down, I had my husband. I'm like, we need to call our doctor and make sure our embryo is okay. Like, what's going to happen? You just don't know. Things could change tomorrow. And to to not feel like you have, um, as a woman, that, you know, <laughs> hell, your state has your back is just a really scary feeling. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's it all makes me angry. Every You know, with policies, everything changes as the wind changes. And it's insane. Mm-hmm. It's insane. Yeah, you, um, you talked about 
writing a lot of material and, and hearing back from women about women specific things. I would mm -hmm. say your your material's universal. I sit there in the audience as a man and really enjoy it. Um, but is that something you're thinking about? Like when you're writing your material, you're thinking specifically about the women in your audience? For sure. I feel like, um, listen, there's plenty of male comedians out there. They've been telling, you know, they've been talking to the guys for a really long time. And I try and really disarm guys when they come to my show. Like, I want you to understand why your wife, girlfriend, partner, why that they feel the way that they feel, especially like on this next hour that I just shot. It's like, why do we get mad when you go play golf for nine hours? I'm going to explain it to you in a way that, so you understand she's not nagging, but this is the psychology behind it. So I really try and like get on their level and break things down for them. Mm. But yes, I'm always talking to the girls. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, I'm a woman. Hear me roar. So why would I not tell the girls like I get you? I see you. I hear you. This is what's happening. Uh, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Why would I not? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. You you filmed your most recent special at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. I sure did. Uh, don't know when that's coming out yet. No, no, no firm date. No, that we'll find out very soon. So we'll announce that soon. Yeah, it, it'll probably be like uh, end of this year, top of next year. OK, I did see a bit of it on when you were on tour, I think. Is that uh you had a whole bit about Kate Upton and, and yeah. Justin Verlander. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll never watch Justin Verlander pitch in the same way. In fact, last season I was watching him pitch and I was just thinking, do you remember that bit about Heather? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got bits about everybody. Don't you worry. Nobody's safe. Yeah. It, it's great. It's great. So I'm really looking forward to it. And you're participating in Netflix as a joke again uh, coming up on Sunday, May 5th, right? Yes. So I'm taking a whole new show, which I currently am writing this week. I'm like, what is happening? Um, I'm wrapping up this comeback tour. So I have two last shows in Sacramento and Salt Lake City. And then I'm to do try out a bunch of new material at the Netflix is a joke festival which is amazing and then I'm going to pop into a bunch of other comedian shows during the week it's really wild it's like it's almost like going to summer camp it's two weeks of just being in LA and running into every comedian buddy that you know and doing their shows and people coming to do your shows and it's it's just like a comedy jam and it's awesome yeah, so you have to come up with a whole new hour. Yes? Well, I, yes and no. They were like, well, you've already, I just played L.A. and I played the Pantages, which is a, a huge venue there. So, so many people came out to that. So I feel like I got to show up with some some new stuff. So yesterday I was literally sitting on my screen and porch. You know what I mean? Just with just sucking in pollen all afternoon. I was like, <laughs> I will be outside. It's nice out. It's that like perfect time right in Georgia, right before it turns to into 102 degrees and 90% humidity. So I was just really soaking in the allergies yesterday, writing <laughs> some new material yeah wow well that's exciting looking forward to to seeing what you come up with and just wow just in awe of also like having to write under that kind of pressure it's it's always pressure but the funny thing is i think about when um you know whenever i'm starting a new tour it's so funny you like panic for two days and then you take it out on the road and it, it writes itself on the road so huh. you just gotta like roll the dice and, and and trust that you know what you're doing wow okay yeah but well i just want to end on this mm -hmm. it, it's it's that you've been so kind and your reputation is that you've been very kind and generous with your audience. You're giving of yourself. You're constantly generating material and you're thinking about your audience and what your audience would benefit from. And also your reputation after shows, being generous with fans, connecting with them, uh, talking with them at length about their own issues after yeah. you're their therapist. As I'm TikTok essentially the Taylor you. Swift of comedy, which is now <laughs> I'm starting to figure this out. A lot of material, very kind, and I give a lot to the fans. Yes, thank you for that. Well, okay, so, yeah, continue. That, 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 that's all I'll say is that, that you've been very kind to fans and you've been very kind to come into GPB and, uh, and speak with me about your comedy. Thank you so much. Listen, I'm so honored and I'm so grateful that people come to shows and that they can relate to the material. So why would I not spend extra time with people who have invested in me. I'm just so incredibly grateful. And um, thank you for having me. This has been a, such a thoughtful conversation. Well, that's uh, comedian Heather McMahon, uh, Atlanta-based, the Taylor Swift of comedy. <laughs> and she's going to be participating in the Netflix is a Joke Comedy Special uh, Comedy Festival on Sunday, May 5th. And also, we've got a forthcoming special. Watch Netflix for that. Heather, thanks again. Thanks so much.